Good morning uh, and good afternoon. I'm not sure if it's just at noon or right before or right after. So um, I don't know if I've ever addressed a, a crowd right at noon. So whatever's appropriate, I hope that you're having a good day. I'm Ben Ayers. I'm Dean of the Terry College of Business. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Exec Ed Center and our inaugural MBA Lunch and Learn. We are so incredibly proud of our MBA programs uh, here in Atlanta, Executive MBA, Professional MBA, Online MBA, and in Athens, our full-time MBA. And we're incredibly proud of our alumni and the great successes that you are having. Uh, we're working um, every day to add value for your degree, and we're pleased to launch this series as another way that we can contribute back to you. And, and also thank you for choosing the Terry College for your graduate studies. Uh, upcoming in June, we'll have Angie Brown, who's the Senior Vice President of Technology for Home Depot, a company that we're all familiar with. And then in the fall, October 17th, we'll have George Azee. He's the founder and CEO of FinQuery that was formerly known as Lease Query. George is a former uh, student of mine many years ago, and he's had incredible success uh, as an entrepreneur in building his company. Today, we are thrilled to have Karen Bennett as our inaugural speaker, and what a great time to have a fantastic leader here during uh, Women's History Month. Karen is the Executive Vice President and Chief People Officer at Cox Enterprises. We're all familiar with Cox. It's a family-owned company with $20 billion in annual revenues. She has more than 30 years of experience leading various departments, emphasizing talent potential and employee experience. Karen is a graduate of the Terry College of Business, where she earned both her undergraduate degree and her executive MBA. Karen serves on the board of directors of the National Center for Human Rights, Civil and Human Rights, the Society of Human Resource Management Foundation, the Human Resources Leadership Forum of Atlanta, as well as the Metro Atlanta American Heart Association. She also serves in Georgia State University's HR uh, Roundtable Consortium. And last year, in April, we were pleased at the Terry College to recognize Karen as one of our distinguished alumni award winners, very well deserving, and we are pleased to have her today. So please join me in welcoming Karen Bennett. I'm gonna officially call it. Good afternoon, right? We are out now afternoon. It is a pleasure to get to be here. And Dean Ayers, thank you very much for the nice introduction. This is the first of its kind. So let's see how we do with this, right? Um, I was delighted to get the opportunity to be your first speaker for a lunchtime series. And I, it, it dawned on me, it is National Women's History Month, right? So um, we're not having an allegiance to any particular school colors here. We were really just honoring what goes on with Women's Month here in the color scheme that you see or some of the upfront music. But I just wanted to take an opportunity and try to draw for you some parallels of what you might think about with your own career development and maybe what a 125 year old company can teach you about that. I think one of the questions I get most often asked is what all is Cox Enterprises? And if you're in Atlanta, you've probably heard of our name. Uh, as Dean said, we're a very large company, about 55,000 employees across the globe, headquartered here in Atlanta, but maybe not a, a it's a hometown recognized name, but maybe not a consumer facing brand. So I thought I would take the opportunity to kind of educate you on what Cox is, but then also kind of tell you the parallels that I've seen in our company's growth over 125 years to perhaps my own, which has been 30, not 125, but nonetheless, I think some of the same parallels and lessons we can learn. And then we'll open it up for Q&A after that. Just anything that you want to ask, let's get it on the table and I'm sure we'll get you out of here on time. So let me first start with Cox Enterprises. What exactly is Cox Enterprises? We'll give you a quick show here. So a lot of different shots in there, and I'll tell you a little bit about those businesses as we go. But um, let me start with my journey to Cox. So I was an undergrad at Terry, and like all of you that had a business undergrad opp opportunity, you recognized all the coursework that you would take. And for me, that became the process of elimination of which major I would actually decide to go with. And at the time, um, there was a course called Personnel Management. So now I just completely dated myself into the, in the prior millennial. Um, 
And what was fascinating to me was that I'd had courses in accounting. I had courses in marketing. I actually really had a fondness for operations management because it began to show you how the business could run. And you could do that with mathematical solution and know that that would work. But then this thing called personnel management was the wild card. Because you could have correlations of this kind of recognition gets you this kind of performance, et cetera. But the one variable you can never solve for is human behavior. You can know a lot about it, but it's different to each and every one of us. And so I was smitten with that. I thought, you know, it's the one thing that you can have a realm of possibility, but not necessarily certainty in. And I kind of liked that. Maybe that's a little bit of kind of banging your head against the wall, but I kind of liked it. And so um, that's how I ultimately got a management degree with that concentration and went on to start a career in human resources management by then, it was called. And it was through that journey that I, you know, uh, I'll share just the career journey of you have your degree, you go and look for something in your profession. And for me, it was mastery. And, and I say that because the one thing I found to be true as a college grad, and maybe it was true for you, is without the experience, it's hard to get the work experience. And so um, I accepted the first roles I could get in the HR space, but I really did make it my mission to learn everything that I could. And that might be raising my hand for the that doesn't sound like my job, but I'll try to do it sort of things, to recognizing that there were certifications and things that came along with my field of discipline that I wanted to go and obtain. And so I went and got a you know, compensation certification professional, a, a certification as a senior HR professional, whatever those things are. Really, I think part of it was a confidence builder, but it was also a skill builder. And so it put me on a path very early in my career to recognize I will always be growing. I always thought there was some station you got to, you've ascended, now you're done. And I was like, that was a myth. You'll always have to be growing. And so that is really how I have grown my career is by recognizing and learning different opportunities than just the path that I started. And I share that because I think that's the similarity when I talk about, oh, I've got better sound now. That was great. Um, when, you, when I talk about what it is you can learn from a 125-year-old company, I think that is the thing that Cox and I share in common. And we started as what was a newspaper in Dayton, Ohio. Um, our founder, James Cox, uh, bought, borrowed money from friends and bought a newspaper that he ultimately named the Dayton Daily News 125 years ago. And his mission at that time, if you think about what media was at that time, it really was only newspapers. And to re recognize that people that didn't live in the cities but in more rural areas didn't have the opportunity to have the news of the day brought to them, that was kind of his personal mission. And so he started with Dayton Daily News over time many, many newspapers across the nation was really the birth of how Cox started. I think we all know how newspapers have gone, right? And so it was through that, this idea you have to continue to grow, that we had to begin as a business to understand how else might we diversify, but it goes back to what is your mission, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. If this was getting the news to the people of what was happening either locally or nationally, or even around the world, Newspapers was the first avenue, but what came after that? Radio. And we've got involved in the radio business, and what came after that? Broadcasting, we got involved in the broadcasting business, and so it goes, because that was really the key mission. But it wasn't the only mission of the business, but that is how we started and celebrated last year, 125 years. So the key thing is know your strengths. We knew that we had a very reputable way of providing news unbiased, back when news was unbiased, and a very decent commitment to what journalistic um, credibility was. And so it was through that that we were able to say, how else do we get this information out there? And so while cable might sound like something that's been around since the 80s, cable actually started in the 60s. And it was really just kind of getting information beamed to a different area than your local areas in a broadcast area. And so we started in the cable business before people really might have known what cable was. But I share that because that then became the launch pad for all the businesses that we now have today. And I'll take you through what a few of those are because 
I don't think that that's always certain to people when they hear about Cox. You've probably heard of Cox Communications, depending on the part of the country you might live in or you have family members in, that was their internet provider. That was their cable company. And that is very well known outside of Atlanta because the Atlanta market belongs to Comcast. We divide up the country and how cable operators will operate because you wouldn't want to build dual infrastructure. That just isn't smart, right? But what else are we is probably a key thing to understand. And so I'll give you some examples. Cable is not cable anymore. You can get cable if you want a bundle of, of programming to watch. It is really about connectivity. And so the picture you see on your right is the Las Vegas Stadium, where we provide all of the connectivity in that stadium. So multi-gig speed, throughout Super Bowls, whatever that might be, we're not just to the home, we are obviously to the business, and most importantly, we are to big venues. So that's how you kind of grow from what was your strength of connectivity and take it where technology can take you. The other side of the equation, we talk about something called Cox Automotive. Cox Automotive has over 13 different brands in its portfolio, but only a few are really what you and I would call consumer facing. And so one of these you see here is you see Keenan, he's our advertiser for AutoTrader. You'll also know that there's like an Auto Trader NASCAR brand and that sort of thing. But the two brands that are probably most household known names are Kelly Blue Book. You look it up every time when you're getting ready to buy a car, sell a car, look at a used car, or Auto Trader, where you can actually do the same and see what those cars are that are available and actually do an instant cash offer if you want to sell your car. Shameless plug. Point is, um, the, there's the, the idea of what Auto Trader is, again, knowing your strengths. That's where Auto Trader started all things for Cox Automotive as an advertising outlet, very adjacent to newspapers. Back in the day, Thursday newspaper was the big automotive day. You would have an entire section of that. Well, Auto Trader became kind of the opportunity to replace or augment, be an adjacent business to that. And now we actually provide services all the way from the OEM, so the manufacturer of a car, down to you as a consumer when you're getting financing and leaving that lot because we're giving the dealer all the infrastructure to be able to run those businesses up to and including the financing engine. So things that you wouldn't know behind the scene, but it is our second largest business, Cox Communications being the first and Cox Automotive being our global business and our second. The biggest thing about Cox, and I'll talk about our growth strategies in a minute, is what is the culture of Cox? And it is one, I'll use the word again, of connectivity. But what I really mean is, people say a relationship-driven culture. That can connote a number of different things. We rely on the way that we are structured to get all of our business done. So we have an operating division of Cox Communications. We have an operating division of Cox Automotive. We have an entire portfolio of growth operations, and I'll share what those are with you in a minute. But then we have an enterprises team. And some of those members are here today. It's great to see you. And the enterprises team, some of you might call that in the construct of a holding company. It's where services that can be provided everywhere across the businesses are provided. The things that intuitively make sense. It's your health and welfare benefits. It might be some degree of IT infrastructure, but these are technology companies I'm speaking about in Cox Automotive and CCI. So not necessarily all, but think of office suite sort of infrastructure. It's where your risk management is done, your fleet is done, et cetera, et cetera. And so the enterprises piece is where we either incubate new businesses as they are becoming something viable to be our next division and where we provide services across all of that array of business just to save the you know, duplication of efforts. And that's one of the areas when I try to draw the parallel to how the company operates and how when I ascended to the CEI, the holding company role overseeing all of HR, one of the first things I had to look at is, and I had to think about it from my former role too, why is it, and how do I answer this question, why is it we might be doing something two or three different times in each division with varying deg degree of quality outcome that if we instead did it once, we could increase the quality, no doubt we would increase, increase the efficiency, and have a better employee experience. 
So I'm in the employee experience business, make no doubt, and part of that has to be very grounded in how I'm a responsible steward of company resources. And so many of your companies might have something called COEs, Centers of Excellence. Think of them almost, in the past, we might have called them shared services. If you think about the experience you want for your employees, and let's just draw a country line around it, let's say your employees in the United States, Regardless if they are Cox Automotive employees or Cox Communications employees or members of the enterprise staff, you want them to have the same and stellar employee experience. And so if you can pull together the right set of resources and design that to do that more economically, but more importantly, better quality, better outcomes, speed, however you would want to measure that, why wouldn't you do that? I ask that question a lot and I get that I know the answer, Karen. I know what we need to do. But the idea is we are doing a lot of, of the movement of personnel across all the business is happening to help form these COEs, these centers of excellence, such that everyone has the same opportunity to gain or garner the same experience as they grow their career. And most of these things, some of them are services provided. Think of benefits, think of you know the employee service centers, address changes and things like that. But the others are more developmental. So think about what your companies may offer in the way of leadership development courses. We aren't growing leaders for Cox Automotive. We're growing leaders for the entire enterprise of Cox. And the culture that we want leaders to lead through and the values and the, the efforts that leaders put forward to grow their teams, we want that to be universal, regardless of which piece of the business or frankly, what part of industry we're in. And so in this past year, we've said, we need to pull all leadership development together and let's grow Cox Enterprises leaders. And as I look across the room, and I'll use myself as a great example of that, I've been in three different divisions of Cox in the nine years I've been there. I glad someone tapped me as being an enterprise leader not just a one, you know, one a media person. I came in through the Cox Media Group, and then I moved into Cox Communications, and then was asked to take this role about a year and a half ago. And the idea is everyone should have that opportunity to grow a career and never leave the campus, figuratively speaking. We are a very big organization. We continue to grow. We have a really special culture in a place that wants to grow its own employees and say, stay here. You could go work in marketing and automotive tomorrow and you could go work in marketing at Cox Communications the next day, but we have to create that path. And so part of that relationship base is to understand we want people to be able to move fluidly across the business. And so the company does that, but more importantly, that's something I chose to do. No one said I had to go division to division, but when asked, I was you know, clearly ready to serve, but I really wanted the experience because you have this culture that is a wonderful organization in Cox, but it's different place by place. The speed of business, the amount of change, is it in an acquisition mode, is it in a maturing mode? Those things matter in how you'll operate and how you'll grow your skills. So what else have I learned at Cox? So first off, look for synergies. Um, great examples of that, and I'll share how that worked for me in my career too, but let's first talk about Cox. I talked about the fact that our roots were in the Dayton Daily News. How many of you have heard of Axios? Hopefully you subscribe to Axios. So Axios is one of the most credible digital media resources that exist, and it's really kind of recognized worldwide. It was huge at Davos, apparently the biggest draw at the World Economic Forum. But the idea of we could start with something as a paper, newspaper, literally tactile newspaper, in print once a day in the rural community of Dayton, Ohio, and now become a worldwide regarded place for and source for information, it's just building on our synergies. So we acquired the majority of Axios, still with the owners that are the founders in place, about two years ago. And the idea was, we know we have journalistic roots and we know that we uphold what journalism should stand for. But what is journalism in the new age? And Axios clearly is not only culturally they fit how we are and how they grow their employees and how they treat um, the credibility that needs to go in journalism, but also it fits in with what we do and the information that we share. 
So we still own the Dayton Daily News. We still own the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. We now also own Axios. And we also understand that while we might be the funding mechanism for them, that we always keep an arm's length from what, we, what happens in journalism. That's what keeps journalism the credibility, the, with the credibility it needs to have to really stay relevant to each of us as consumers. So that synergy for Cox has really proved very well. Um, Axios is a, just such a fun brand to have, um, but more importantly, it gives you news the way I think all of us like it today. It's a little snackable. It's quick. Why does it matter? Tell me what I need to know. If I want to go deeper, you're going to give me the links to do that. And I think that's just how we all consume our information today. So if I look at those same synergies in my own career, I mentioned I started in HR and moved my way up. But there's a lot of, you know, we call HR just what we might call finance as if it's one bucket. There's a lot of different areas within HR. And I started more on the, I'll call it the quantitative side. So I started with uh, managing benefit plans and, manage, and managing pension plans and managing compensation. But over time, as I had opportunities, I would raise my hand. So here's my Best example, the only one I'll share with you. Um, I worked for Turner Broadcasting for many, many years before I came to Cox. And a colleague, uh, head of CNN's HR, was going on maternity leave. And the question was, in addition to what you do, would you fill in over there? That team, high-functioning team, just kind of keep oversight for them. I'm like, happy to do it, happy to do it. 9-11 happened in the middle of what was to be my uh, three-month interim assignment. Um, probably the most defining moment in many of our lives, but certainly for me in my career, working as the person leading the charge for a news organization of journalists who were taking in all this information. And I think it's safe to say, I think the world turned to CNN during 9-11 to even understand what was going on in our country, let alone the world at large. And so what was originally a I'll fill in opportunity, became this exposure to an entire set of responsibilities for which there was no playbook. Right, so you think you're gonna learn and you're gonna amass skills, and you will, and there'll be places from which you can learn and draw upon, not in our lifetime, just had not happened. And no amount of business continuity planning was gonna get us where we needed to go. And there was, believe it or not, there was some um, assuredness in, was it gonna be, was I doing this well or not? Was I helping? I mean, that was really it. Am I helping people? Am I helping the business? Whatever that needs to look like, because we have no idea what this even means, but we're just trying to get news out to people. Um, ironically, we had an HR, global HR conference going on at the same time in Atlanta, and we couldn't get these people back home. And um, so they were here to stay, and we didn't know for how long. So we did anything imaginable. We ran or helped run the switchboards because the phones were blowing up, the world calling in, what, what is the latest, what have you heard? We you know, had our standard spiel, we worked shifts around the clock, we had EAPs come in to help employees because the, you can imagine the film footage and things they were dealing with, it was a whole thing. But I share that to say I wanted to learn this other area of HR in a different part of the business that I was normally a part of. And who could have known exponentially, not only the impact personally that would make, but professionally that would make. And ultimately, I went and ran that organization and some others, but um, it wasn't because it was a, cl a clear career path. It was just the synergy of the moment and how do you take what you know and good decisioning and the support that your leadership will give you to try to work your way through a situation. And it was me and many, many others that made that happen. But um, the synergies exist. They exist in our own personal career journeys, but they exist for companies, and they usually don't have that kind of um, heartstring need that goes with it. So our history. This is Governor Cox. This is our founder, James M. Cox. And that is a newsroom, as it looked back in the day. Again, Atlanta Journal-Constitution, if you're from this area, uh, that's how newspapers used to be delivered, in a wagon. Um, that's how, I guess, the, the cottage industry of being the, uh, the newspaper delivery boy got started, based on what you see there. And then I mentioned Axios. Quite a journey. Um, they are based in D.C. They have offices throughout uh, the U.S. And, and abroad, but um, very different construct, all with the same goal of making sure that you know, unfiltered, unbiased news gets out to readers. And then here's 
what it feels like to work at Cox, taking that same idea. Um, this looks like me standing there. So this is an employee roundtable I think we hosted. And again, affording us all the ways that we have learned to connect after our COVID years. Most everything we do these days is hybrid. And it makes sense that it would be, not only because we have people that work all across the country. I think in here, I'm at one of our businesses in Florida, but I'm broadcasting across the country to a group of employees, and you make it work. You build upon, if there's anything we can do, we know we can broadcast, and we know that we can stream, and we know that we're gonna have the technology that makes all that work. But then how do you use that to your advantage in the way you still run your business, which is different now than it was pre-COVID. So just an example of this is how we show up. Um, we don't ask everyone to come to one room anymore. We say, let's get the best technology running in every room, and then we can all feel like we're together. But what we haven't sacrificed is, is togetherness. It just looks different. And that's just really part of the Cox culture. Okay, so owning your development. Um, two ways to think about this, and I'll, and I'll tie it into how that might relate to Cox. But um, you'll have the opportunity, I hope, in all of your companies, both as an individual but as a leader of others, to have at least that annual conversation, if not more frequently, of what's next? What do you need? How do you need to round this out? But people can give you that guidance all the time, or you can just ask others that are in your career, career field, how did you get to this next level, or what have you? And you can get, a, everyone's journey's different. I just shared part of my journey with you. Um, you'll get some common threads, things that experiences people needed or the types of training and things they went and got. But at the end of the day, you have to own it. So you can collect that list from whomever, but no one can work the list but you. And so how you own your development will be everything about how you either choose to stay at the company that you're with because they're supportive of how you want to develop and grow, or that you may choose to go find a company that will support you in what that needs to be. Hopefully it's the former and not the latter. But the idea is I always encourage you to own what it is you want to do next. And you can get opinions from everyone, but ultimately you have to create that path. And that's not different for business too. If I think about the things that we have done at Cox, how we grow, has everything to do with what is, again, we're family owned, so what were our original missions and what were our roots? Where did we see adjacencies in our business? As I mentioned, moving newspapers and now into digital, moving out of broadcast, moving into more straight connectivity and internet access. Uh, automotive started as an advertising platform. It's a million things different now. And now we are also saying, what are we doing to give back to our communities? And what are we doing that also aligns with the family values of our company? And I say family, meaning we are family owned. And the family has some things they are very committed to. Journalism is one of them. The opportunity for fair and, internet and affordable internet access is another. But sustainability of the planet is a very big area for us. And so we encourage a lot of that work through employees and the things that we do to volunteer in the communities that we operate in. So you've got someone here that looks like they're working at an urban garden, not uncommon. We give people volunteer hours to go and do those very things to kind of reinvest and make it better for the communities that we live and work in. But then we also took it a step further and said, we wanna be in businesses that do that. If we really are about how do we help the planet, then what do those businesses look like? So we started a zero waste to landfill initiative 15 years before any other company thought of doing that. In this past year, we actually hit that zero waste to landfill goal. And that's impressive, not only because it's a hard goal to reach, but we have continued to grow. Have we been the same company, size, businesses, etc.? Might have been a little easier to achieve. But we have become a very different company since then. But it's part of the commitment of our owners and of our families. So, we also have done things like move into the sustainability business. And so I wanted to show you a video of what that looks like in something that we call controlled environment agriculture. Some of us might think of that as a, that a greenhouse. It's a greenhouse, but it's, as they would say, it's not your grandfather's greenhouse. So, okay, not your grandfather's greenhouse, right? So I have, I have to tell you, we bought in uh, 19, uh, in, uh, 
2020 and then in 2022, two different businesses. One's called Moochie Farms. You just saw that there. The other is called Bright Farms. And depending on where you shop, you will see these in your grocery, grocery stores. Um, one is based primarily out of Ontario, just over the Michigan border. Uh, Bright Farms has actually got a number of farms throughout the US. Bright Farms, which you didn't see footage of, grows leafy green vegetables. So think of spinach, lettuces, etc. cetera. Um, and I do say, they are like no lettuces you will have ever had because the thing is, the minute they are ready for harvest, they are picked, sealed, and shipped. And there's, they're never introduced to pesticides, et cetera, et cetera, which is part of the sustainability, right? But it's not just, sustainability and healthier choice, it's also what it does to land. So if you think about how you deplete the, the mineral and the construct of soil by farming over and over, you don't get the same quality harvest, so it's inefficient, but you also don't get the same nutrient load, which is also not healthy. So the idea of being able to do this large quantity greenhouses, and we're growing by no pun intended, we are building more of those greenhouses and one will be in Macon, should open at the end of this year for Bright Farms, is to be able to help avoid this idea of unhealthy or unfresh foods by having distributors that are in geographies that make it easy to disperse uh, food that is fresh for weeks, but you know, most food, it's a couple of weeks old before you get it on your shelf and that's just because of the way it's grown and harvested and whatnot. This gets food within days to be on a grocer's shelf. Uh, Moochie Farms is a family, so you can see the similarities there. It was a family owned business we acquired in 2022, and it grows what they call uh, vine crops. And so you saw the pictures, peppers, tomatoes, cucumbers, strawberries, um, also most incredible business. And you've got people from, so talk about diversifying, you've got people from seed producers, so understanding how to make a disease-resistant tomato seed. How do you evaluate that job, right? Um, all the way up to those that help pick and seal and get these things ready and out to ship. And so this, you'd say, wow, that's really divergent from what are two very technology-centric companies, but are they? Because so much of what you, if you even noticed in that video that you see, is all technology-enabled. And what I mean by that is that these greenhouse production systems are set up such that there is no human intervention other than inspection for quality until a crop is ready to be picked, right? All of that is being technology enabled. You'll see the carts that are, have designs on the floor that as something is harvested, it knows its route and where to go. And so you don't have people you know, driving things around. So you're not only having a different set of jobs that are probably more enriching for people to perform, but you're enabling through technology all the pieces that it doesn't have an added value component to have a person do it. So it makes sense because we're helping save the planet, but it also makes sense because it actually is a very technology centric sort of business as is the rest of our, um, as the rest of our portfolio. So, I lost our screen, let me see if I can get it back for a minute. There we go. So I wanna talk about this for a minute. So take some risk and have fun. This has been, these have been small investments for us that we think uh, the farming businesses that will be big growth opportunities for us. But it was a little bit of a risk. And as a private company, you're not beholden to shareholders in the same way that you can take risk when you've evaluated responsibly what you think the growth and return of those businesses could be. But I also want to challenge you a little bit about how you take risk and have some fun. And what I'll share with you is, I went back at the age of 45, so don't look at my year or you can figure out how old I am now. I went back to get my executive MBA at the age of 45. And you might say, and I was a senior vice president at a very large company, and you might say, why were you doing that? And I was doing that because I was really willing to take a risk. Um, but I also recognized that how you grow looks different depending on the generation of life that you're in. So I mentioned earlier in my career, and for all of us, I think we grow through amassing experiences that our employer gives us, and then we may grow further by um, getting certifications or things that also kind of bolt on to what our work experience is. And then hopefully, uh, if you work for a company that really supports how you show up in the community, then hopefully you've grown by the type of community involvement that you get involved with for yourself personally, for fulfillment, but also um, for your company, 
representing your company. So as the Dean shared, some of the things that I'm involved in are both passions for me, but they are also things that are supported by Cox and they're just good for our community, right? Those are ways that you grow. It's not just in the job titles, it's also how the rings around your work grow. And so for me, that's where the EMBA entered because while I was at some of the, you know, largest seats, I guess, at the table, to use that analogy. I was also, I think, kind of relegated to the HR person. So if we're gonna have an emotional thing about this merger or this divestiture, got to ring around Karen, she's gonna handle that. And you're like, really? That's not, you know, hmm. And so, but you do realize, I mean, we all get kind of pigeonholed in our places. And I didn't take it as a Karenism as much as it was truly about what people perceive the role of HR to be at that point in time. And I was like, I've got a business degree for heaven's sakes, and I've been working 20 years. I think I know, you know, I've got this figured out. But I was like, no, oh, you know, a lot's changed in 20 years. And the role, especially of HR and how it integrates into the business, and sometimes it's the axis on the way the business revolves, if you think about the COVID years, I recognize there is something different there than what it would have been when I was 20 years before getting my undergrad. So I, I came back here, right to this building, and uh, pursued my executive MBA. And it was the best thing I ever did for a number of reasons. Not only I love being a double dog, and I love being able to say that, but it really did reinforce to me. It Frankly, it spruced up a lot of skills that had laid dormant for a number of years, but it really did reinforce to me and I think to those around me in my class, because I was the only HR person in there, just how all of those things intersect in business. And it's not this sidecar of, oh, there might be you know, an outburst, let's get HR in here. It was like, oh, we realized from the jump, this is gonna have to be a piece we consider as we grow and evolve our business. So it, for me, was a great stepping stone because it kind of brought to current all of the uh, business experiences that I needed that some, I mean, that was on me. Some of those that I let lay dormant a number of years because it wasn't my primary responsibility. But it was also those things that as I had the opportunity to ascend to the CEI role, I have responsibilities beyond HR. So I have responsibility for brand creative and marketing. Um, I have a small P&L that you saw me um, from Florida hosting from um, called Idea Bar, which is an ad agency. And I have all of our corporate communications and corporate affairs responsibilities. And those things I really do attribute to having had that broader experience. And I took a very interesting point in my career and life to do that. And I absolutely tell you, I have no regrets. So you have to take some risk, and that was risky. I look back, I was talking to someone earlier, and you're like, how did you ever have time to do this program in addition to having a full-time job? But you make time. And you recognize that it's probably something that none of us ever walk away and say, I'm not sure why I did that. We absolutely know what we did that. And so those risks, and that was risky to try to do and still maintain the set of responsibilities, it was also a lot of fun <laughs> after it was over. Right, And so think about that for yourself and think about what that means for your growth, especially some of you, as I met you when you came in the room, talked about, yeah, you're here with one of your classmates from your MBA program. This network matters. So if you think about the things that will also help you grow, think about the networks that you have. Think about what your UGA network and your Terry College network affords you by coming to events like this people that you'll meet, companies you'll learn more about, um, career opportunities that might manifest themselves, but the idea is all of that is on you and owning your development, but have some fun with it too. These should not feel like these are arduous things that you came and had lunch and listened to somebody talk to you for 45 minutes, that in fact, maybe you made a new contact. Maybe you learned something about a company. Maybe you thought differently about your own career path. It's all those things really do matter for a reason. So now I will leave you with one of our biggest, um, I'll say brands that we have, employment branding is a little different than consumer branding. And we talked about some of our brands are consumer facing and others not as much. But the one thing that is universal back to this enterprise wide mindset is the employment brand that we have for Cox. And I'm really proud of this because it was created by employees. So, you know, we didn't put this out there as solely aspirational. It was employees saying, what does it mean to work here? 
And we came up with something that's called Make Your Mark. And the idea is that each of us has an opportunity to make a difference, to make a mark in the work that we do for the company at any given point in time. Because the assumption isn't that you'll always stay in the same role or even in the same division, but that hopefully you will stay in Cox. So we started this Make Your Mark about five or six years ago now. And it kind of manifests itself if you follow us on LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram or what have you. It really is employees telling their story of what it is to make your mark at Cox. And it looks different for every one of us because we all sit in different seats, but it's the type of environment that allows you to do that. So I just leave you with that thought before I turn it over to any kind of questions you might have. Think about that for yourself today and the companies that you work with. And are you finding that you're having the ability with not only what you've obtained, which congratulations, in your, in your MBA programs and having now that, you know, badge of honor of being an MBA, but are you getting those opportunities to make your mark? And if you're like, I'm not so sure, think three slides back and realize you own your development. So. So thank you for letting me spend a little time talking about our company at Cox, but also my journey through it and how UGA plays a part. And I'm happy to field any questions until I get the hook to come off stage. Thank you. And, and we do have mic runners because I wanna make sure that everybody can hear. Karen, thanks for being here. Um, one quick question, as you guys have you know, grown as an organization, and as you continue to grow both organic and inorganically, how do you maintain the culture that you've built over the years, over 125 years? Such a great question. Um, and COVID exacerbated that, if I'm being honest, and maybe for all of us, right? Because we, we were apart and we're a very highly relational company, and we didn't quite come back in the same way. I don't think any of our companies did, mandate or not. People just chose to either leave or to use the flexibility they learned to work under two and a half years. It's interesting, and I, this sounds a little cliche, but it is truthful. If you, um, the opening video I had, you saw someone getting out of a Rivian truck, and that's our chairman. So he is the fourth generation of family, Cox family, his name is Alex Taylor. It starts there. It starts at the top with the expectation of no matter how big we grow, and I'll, I hope you'll understand the spirit which I say this, we always want to feel small, which is to say we don't want to feel disconnected just because we've now become 55,000 employees. Do we all still have the same vision, the same things that we want to do? And I think I actually have this right here. These are our things. So we talk about um, our making our mark. We always say, and, and this is true, and we expect it of our leaders, so when I talk about having a, an enterprise leadership mindset, this is what we're talking about. It starts with us. Number one is always do the right thing. And we mean that always, and by your people. Do the right thing by your people. We all have to make tough decisions. We all have to close parts of businesses. We all have to go through reductions in force. But how you treat your people is everything. You'll make the right business decision, but always do the right thing by people. Lead by example. So it's one thing for me to say things to you, it's another thing for me to do what I say I will do and be that example. And that's again, something we expect of all of our leaders, but it starts with Alex, who's my, my boss. Bring out the best in everyone. This is really about understanding everyone's individuality, letting everyone be their authentic self when they come to work, it looks different. You can't just peanut butter spread how you lead because you will leave some people behind and you'll over-index on people that likely are just like yourself. It's just human nature, it's what we do. So you've gotta think about how you're bringing out the best in everyone, and that's complexity for leaders, for sure, but it's one of the reasons why we really invest in um, leader development the way we do. We say make a little music, figuratively, but also literally, so we have house band. We have a group of employees on our Atlanta campus that got together and formed a band. We call them the Mondays, you might ask why, because they play on Monday mornings. And, um, and more and more, they're just getting gigs all over our campus. It seems like everybody's asking for the Mondays. But it really was in the spirit of, we are here to do serious work, but we also recognize back to this individuality, we've got people that've got skills beyond what they bring to us every day. And this group just kind of pulled this together on their own, and we're like, we'll give you stage space, we'll give you an amp, come in here. And they, you know, they play different events. This is them playing one of our 125th 
celebration parties that we had on campus last year, but we also mean it more, more than just playing music, you know, very figuratively. Try to find fun in the work that you do. We are doing really great things, and we have the fortune of doing it in a company that is supportive of taking risk, supportive of trying new ventures. So go along with that, make a little music. And the last thing is simply do it all in the spirit of Cox. So see back to the beginning of the list, right? So think about that every time as you're doing those things. Are you being a good corporate steward? And we are an environment that wouldn't have trouble calling, in a respectful way, of course, calling each other out if we didn't see that happening. It's expected of us as leaders. So I think, to kind of get to your point, it's no matter how big you get, everyone has to understand that, that list of this is how we operate. Because really, why we exist as a family-owned business is just what it says at the beginning here. We're here to build a better future for the next generation, be that consumers and those that we serve, but also the next generation of the family that we hope to have this business still viable for. So thank you for that question. Over here. Yeah, thank you. That was really good. He kind of stole my question, but I'll maybe dive a little deeper. Um, so the getting people back to the space thing, <laughs> yeah. uh, if you could die, and I'm kind of in the culture workplace business, so I'm not trying to uh, ac ask you a loaded question, but we're dealing with more and more CHROs in that space than we ever have, which I think is great. Anything you can tell us about diving deeper, tactics you're using, are you looking at neurodiversity kind of issues? Specifically all that, all, as it's about returning to the office? I just returning to the office and, and, and like you said, things are not going to back the way they used to, yeah. but so how do you prepare the campus or the your field offices, how do you get feedback from your people? How do you do the focus groups and the stuff that everybody's doing now? Thank you, no, great question. And I would have been disappointed if someone hadn't asked me that question because it's been asked every year or every meeting for two years because we're all still struggling with it, right? Um, so every company's done this a little different. While we were closed, I mean, we are an essential service if you think of Cox Communications. So we had people that were on the front line every day people coming in into your home because you were all ramping up your interconnection needs, right? Because everybody was working from home, school, et cetera. So we had this first mission while we were away of keeping people safe, figuring out the work we could do that did not have someone cross the threshold of your home because you didn't want them in there and we didn't want them sick. And so we had to find all these ways to innovate how we work and we kept some of those, you know, enabling technologies and cameras and things to save that. But we are always beholden to those that kept our business operating. So that matters because when we came back, this idea of do we have to come back, we, do we not have to, let's remember half of our workforce never went home. They just had to work safer. So back to doing the right thing always by all of our people, there was an immediate recognition we need to be back, if nothing else in solidarity. What we did stop short of is saying what does that look like? Some companies have mandated, we all know, five days a week, three days a week, these two days, whatever those are. What we said is, we're gonna empower you, but we're also gonna hold you accountable. So each team, each department head, sets their own work schedule of the days that they all agree. These are the days that we come in and we do the work that we do together. Because if you're gonna be on Teams or Zoom all day, not sure it's value add to necessarily be in the office, but where you could and should be interacting personally, get in the office. And so what we have found is we have standing room only on Tuesday, Wednesdays on our campus because we use the closure time of that campus to kind of restack it, make it more hoteling space and contemporize the space. So we've got some days that are standing room only and then you've got Friday, I say you can roll a bowling ball and never hit a person. And so it's, it's still a struggle, right? But you, it's, you kind of learn as you grow. And every week, those numbers of people coming in tick up and up and up. But we have not mandated specific days. Different departments have said, no, we're always a Tuesday, Wednesday shop or whatever they say. But we're, it can't be one size fits all. It goes back to the individuality of the work. But it's tough. I, I tell you, if there was a silver bullet, we would have all fired it by now. Rosie? Yeah. Yeah, we do. We have a security robot that goes through our um, parking decks. I've missed her. She, I think she took a leave uh, during COVID. I've missed Rosie, but thank you. Thanks for acknowledging Rosie. Other question. Thank you for sharing your experience. Sure. This may be a loaded question, but how 
does Cox connect their business strategy with their people strategy? Because that's very important to keep your people no excited doubt. and engaged. No doubt. And particularly as you're continuing to grow and grow through adjacencies or even new ventures, right? So part of it is making sure people even understand what we do. So I'm sharing with you what we do, but I will tell you, for new hires, we're having the same understanding what you do. You join this one department in this one division that works on this, but understand the entire portfolio you're part of. So that's number one, and that, that never stops, right? Because we look different every few months because we've acquired something, we've merged something, we've done whatever. So it's also making sure, and it sounds like such a platitude to say that we communicate, but it's how we communicate. Like, why do we share something with you? Why does it matter? So the best example is we just acquired the remaining shares of a business we had invested in called OpenGov. And fascinating business, we wanna look it up. But what it provides is for local governments infrastructure to run their government websites. So no, Fulton County was not one of their websites, but if you think about as a taxpayer, when you go in to check what your property value is or anything with your local municipality, somebody is building that. And they're not necessarily building it to be consumer grade, they're building that to be compliant. They're a government agent, they work for the people. They help governments, or local municipalities, or even, even states actually, build out their technology facing hubs. That's a really cool business. But we tell people that so they understand why it matters, because we're trying to make the world a better place, and we know that technology is one of the things that we can help do that with. So it's really just kind of keeping up with, this is what we're doing, and this is why we're doing it. And I think it's important, at least, um, someone asked the question earlier about how you keep the pulse with employees. We literally keep the pulse with employees through on always, always on listening, but also very deliberate surveys of do you understand what we're doing and why we're doing it? Because if not, then we need to go back to the beginning of that and say, you're missing whole segments of our business, and that's on us to make sure you understand. Thank you for the question. Look at your mic. Last question. Yeah, Make it a good one. Somewhat related to where, where, where you were going there, Karen. Um, curious what you, a little bit, this could be a secret sauce question, but how do you, how have you approached how you condition your leaders to engage with those change management practices that need to be in place to, to constantly get people to want to iterate and and be the best versions of themselves and push and evolve. Cause right, the Cox has been around for so long and done so many different things and extended into other areas. Clearly there's gotta be an intention and I heard it in the answer you just shared around like raising the awareness and communication. So just curious your, uh, yeah. your, your thoughts and approaches there. You know, I, I've heard it called a secret sauce and I, I'm, I think it is a little bit of a secret sauce because it's just been in the fabric for so many years this is how we operate but we bring in new leaders we bring in new businesses that have very different cultural aspects in the way they grew um, how scrappy they are how mature they are whatever those things are and the idea is you know you first frankly you meet i'll say people i mean businesses and people you meet them where they are and then you show them where we want to go and i that again sounds a lot easier than it is to accomplish and not every leader frankly is desirous of doing that or equipped to do that where it's not about desire and it's about being equipped we can help you know we can say this is what we need from you as a leader here is what we want you to be able to share with people here's where you go when you don't know right and equip people to feel confident to be the leader and the person to evangelize this is what we're doing and, and not doing there will always be people, because this is the human behavior, this is where we started, that will just say, that's not for me. I don't, I'm not interested in this next thing we're going to do. And that's okay, because industry waits, right? We're not gonna have that stay in our culture, because those things would erode our culture. And we'll respectfully let people leave if they don't feel like they can be a part of where we want to grow, either out of their lack of interest or just burnout of what they were doing, they don't want to learn doing something else. Always personal prerogative, but it really is, anytime we're about to embark on any change, we let leaders know it's coming, we let them know as soon as we know what the next step is, how they share, what they share, gobs of resources behind the scenes of the frequently asked or anticipated questions, because the last thing we ever want in a leader is to feel insecure leading. I mean, that's about doing the right thing by leaders, help 
bring them up and bolster them. And if there's something that we haven't provided, we fill in that blank. So, okay. Thank you. Dean, thank you. Karen, thank you so much for being our inaugural speaker for this event and for sharing your words of wisdom, just the, the power of working as individuals together to accomplish the mission. And I love everything you've talked about in terms of owning your own per, uh, professional development. The Terry College can also help with that. <laughs> um, so I have a wonderful bulldog statue. You're the first one who's getting this. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.